Okay, uh, let me give it a title, um, Time Dependent Circuit Analysis. And here's the little notation that makes it not completely redundant given other lectures that are already available with a computer algebra system. So there are still some parts that you need to do yourself. You know, computer algebra system is a tool like a calculator. It can automate the, the mechanical aspects of the problem solving, but we still need a human intelligence for someone to take a look at the circuit analyze it and um, and 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 uh, basically write down a set of equations that describe the system that part in my opinion well that part so far cannot be automated and in my opinion it may never be possible to be automated I mean you know someone can program in some typical setups but let's say you have a completely new circuit that no one has ever seen before then um, having a guarantee that some that it can be analyzed that requires a human being that's the part of the job of an engineer that cannot that cannot be automated so so let me uh, start out with the circuit i guess um, i'll do the discharging cycle first because that's the easier one so i'm imagining a circuit with a capacitor that's uh, hooked up to a register and for the purpose of this analysis i'll just uh, make the job a little bit easier for myself and say that oh i don't know how it happened but um, it so happened that at time t equals zero this capacitor has been prepared so that it has some um, charge plus q naught on one side and charge minus q naught on the other side so this is the picture at time t is equal to zero so it's been prepared in some way um, we are going to take that as a given and then the question uh, that we are trying to answer would be okay so given this setup what is the amount of charge on the capacitor as a function of time that's a question and a related the question would be um, this you know is a complete circuit there should be some kind of current flowing through it so we can ask what is the current also as a function of time so that's our question and uh, we em employ approach that i like to refer to as a general problem solving approach in physics which is that first you come up with a system of equations and this is the part where you need the knowledge of laws of physics some uh, conditions to apply and uh, so this is where you know they, 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 <laughs> how you come up with that system of equations it's very situation dependent and that's where physics knowledge comes in and uh, this part can be automated i just have to do it manually now once you have system of equations then your step for solving it fully through is to well solve the system of equations and the second part is what i'm saying i can automate and maybe i can cut down on some time that i needed previously so uh, i need to come up with a system of equations and this is a circuit i see a loop so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use a uh, uh, <laughs> let me try to pronounce his name right kirsch hoff's rules kirsch hoff's rules um, and when you're doing this circuit, you learn the two rules. Uh, you learn the junction rule and you learn the loop rule. And what you're going to see as we deal with the time dependent circuit, you will see that the kind of circuits we tackle are often so simple that junction rule um, doesn't give you anything useful. Like if I wrote down the junction rule anywhere here, it's just gonna give me a trivial equation that says, oh, current coming in is equal to current going out. Yeah, I knew I is equal to itself. So, all right. So, um, so here we are not going to be using junction rule because it doesn't give us anything useful. But we will use the loop rule to write down an equation that holds for this circuit, and we'll take it from there. So, uh, let me imagine starting from this point on the loop, and I'm going to go up as I go up across this capacitor. Uh, from the negatively charged side side to the positively charged side 
I should be gaining a voltage. And this is where your uh, memory of these relationships are useful. Uh, let me just write them all, write the three down so that I have it to refer to. The voltage drop across the register is current times resistance. Voltage change across a capacitor is given by amount of charge per, divided by capacitance. And this comes from the definition of capacitance. And later on, it'll come in the amount of voltage change across the inductor is equal to the inductance times the time derivative of current. So these are the three basic relationships governing linear circuits. So uh, let me use this uh, expression here to write down the voltage change across the capacitor as I go across it. So that should be plus uh, amount of charge on the capacitor divided by C. I'm giving some thought to writing down plus because I imagine going from here to here that from a negatively charged side to the positively charged side, you know, the electric fields are going this way. So I think I, my voltage would go up as I go from here to there. And that is the case. And I need to think that through each time. Okay, go along the wire, no voltage change. Now I'm going across the register of resistance R in the same direction as the direction that I'm labeling my current. So I should have a drop in voltage minus I um, R. That's the voltage change across the uh, register. And I'm back to the same point. And Kirchhoff's loop rule says that when you add up all the voltage changes, they add up to zero. So this is our equation. Now, as you look at it, um, it should perplex you a little bit because um, hmm, I have Q here. I have I here. I don't know any of them. Those are the quantities I'm looking for. Uh, I have two unknowns, one equation. So uh, I can't solve it. It's not solvable. Um, and, and, you know, as it stands, it's, it, that is right. Uh, this is where um, I, you're familiar with, the, with the, how these devices work is helpful. Because when you know the Q stands for the amount of charge on the capacitor, then you can relate this Q to the amount of current that goes through the capacitor, which will be the same current as this because of, you know, single load. And this current is given by the derivative rate of change of the amount of charge on the capacitor. Now, one thing I'll caution you is the sign. This could be plus or minus. You do have to be careful and you have to go through this reasoning for each situation. So I imagine myself at time t equals zero, uh, my charges are beginning to flow out. And I, I guess as it flows out, I want it to be a positive current. Okay, so I want my uh, I to be positive at time equals zero. And when I imagine dq dt, you might notice that my charge should be decreasing because these positive charges are flowing around to meet up with this negative charge here. So this quantity here is itself negative, but I want my current itself to be positive. So, oh, so I'm going to need a minus sign here. So with that reasoning in the background, I write down, okay, my current I is equal to minus dq dt. And if you don't go through this process carefully, uh, you'll get a sign error. And, you know, sign errors are common. Uh, if you get it, it's not, you know, that big of a deal. You know, correct it. <laughs> Notice that you have a sign error and correct it, and you're all golden. So, so let me simplify this a little bit. Since I see that uh, I can just plug it in the uh, I, so let me just plug it in so that I have a single equation to deal with. So I have a single equation that says Q over C plus um, R times dQ dt, because, you know, minus times minus is equal to zero. Okay, so I have one equation in terms of uh, one, not unknown variable, but apparently an unknown function in terms of one unknown function of time. And uh, so this completes the first step. I have come up with my system of equation of one. One is the system, <laughs> and um, and it has a right number of equations for one unknown. 
So yeah, so now the remainder of this problem solving step is okay, solve them. Um, and, and this is, uh, I guess, in the other lecture where I do it by hand, where I spend the remaining seven minutes. Uh, let me do this uh, automatically using this uh, computer algebra system so that I can see if I can beat myself doing this by hand. So, uh, and to, I guess, show fully the power of this system, let me not even simplify this equation even slightly. I'm just gonna plug it in as it is. So I do need to prepare some things. I need to declare the var variables I'll be using. So that will be Q, C, R, P. Oh, and I might use I later, so let me declare that as well. Okay. And, oh, I hope I didn't overwrite. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Let me just give this a try. Okay, I, I think it'll be fine. <laughs> Somehow when I type in I, that's an imaginary I. This I is the uh, current I. By the way, in uh, electrical engineering, uh, they define J as the imaginary number to avoid the exact problem. Okay, I have my variables defined. Um, let me write down my equation. So, um, wonder, uh, let me just give it this a little bit of a try. So there's a function for differentiation that's called a diff. Um, and what I want to double check and make sure is that if I don't define Q as a quantity, uh, symbol representing a function, that I'll still be fine. So let me give this a try. So different derivative of Q with respect to T. Uh, all right, so I got to define Q as a function. So <laughs> let me look at the help file. How did they? Okay. Um, Q is equal to function. I sometimes forget the syntax, <laughs> mainly because I'm not as familiar with the Sage math as my other computer algebra systems I've used for my other job for a very long time before I started teaching. Um, I believe the place where I'll get a um, uh, I'll get a good documentation. It's the function that I intend to use to solve this uh, differential equation. That's gonna be a function called the dissolve. And you know, if you don't remember the function name, then you you would Google it. You know, Sage math to solve differential equation. Um, now, as I look at dissolve, uh, usually documentation gives some examples, and I'm looking to find in one of the ah, uh, there it is. So that's the example. All right, let me give that a try. So. Q is equal to function of Q, that's the symbol I'm using as a function of time. Okay, let me try that uh, command derivative of Q. Okay, that, that seems good. So, um, so I'll go with that. So now I can write down what my equation is. My equation, I'm gonna put that into this variable. My equation is um, Q uh, divided by C, plus um, the resistance times the first order derivative of Q with respect to T. And I have to be careful with this equal sign. So this is what we call assignment symbol because what I have in the computer uh, programming language, because what I have on this side will get assigned to this uh, uh, variable equal. Uh, what I want for here is not assignment symbol, but an equality symbol. And that equality symbol in Sage Math and Python is double equal sign. <laughs> so that's equal to zero. So that's my equation. Good. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess I have my equation. Oh, so I think I'm just ready to use dissolve. Well, <laughs> well, I'm ready to use dissolve, except that I don't remember the syntax. <laughs> the syntax is the differential equation um, d var. Uh, D bar is the, oh, dependent variable, so that would be our Q. Uh, initial or boundary condition. Uh, let me not specify them. Although, you know, I could. Uh, let me try it once without specifying it, and then I'll specify it. Um, I bar, uh, that's the indep independent variable, so I would call that T. Okay, so D solve 
uh, differential equation that's stored in EQ, my dependent variable is Q, and my initial uh, initial conditions I'll say um, none for now. And I, by the way, you don't have to do this. This is all um, default. So, and the e, with e bar is not. I am forgetting the syntax. Uh, let me do this. Mm -hmm. Ah, initial conditions. Okay, ICS. All right. Uh, this solves different equation. Um, Q initial conditions is equal to none, and independent variable is uh, my t. Okay. Okay. Let's see what it does. Oh, it might complain, I think, because uh, uh, these things tend to try to solve these equations in a, under super general assumptions. Oh, no, never mind. I spoke too soon. There's the answer. So you have to be uh, careful here. This underscore C, it stands for integration constant. It's different from this C. Um, and yeah, that, that looks right. Um, so amplitude or the magnitude, the initial charge, Q0 times um, e to the power of, the exponential of minus t divided by rc. That's uh, um, what I solved. And I guess this time, um, I, this took me 20 minutes, so maybe I didn't save any time, but I talked more. <laughs> and I didn't have to do any separation of variables. Let me try just do one more thing. Because, um, so we have this integration constant. But one of the things is, uh, we know the initial condition. We know what our initial charge was. So it feels to me that I should be able to just get that um, so, you know, if I were to write down, you know, something like Q is, a, uh, Q as a function of time is equal to uh, C, well, constant times E to the minus T over RC. Uh, that's the equivalent of someone forgetting the integration constant, or I forgot to specify what this coefficient should be. So let me try to get a... a complete answer. Now, I could get this complete answer by uh, working out, okay, what is, uh, um, I, I can complete it by solving for, where I said, okay, Q at time equals zero is something, and I set that equal to be Q naught, and I can do that. But as long as I'm using computer algebra system, let me see if a computer algebra system can get me all the way there. So let me look at the, this documentation again for initial conditions. How do I specify the initial conditions? So there must be some example for specifying initial conditions. Um, uh, uh, it looks like some kind of an array. I don't like an array. Um, Oh wait, initial conditions tend to, yeah, I also don't know what that means. Um, one, three, seven, it does nothing. Okay, I'm gonna give it a guess. Initial boundary conditions, oh wait, wait, initial conditions are then interpret, uh, there it is. So the first value would be your initial x value. So, or initial independent variable value. So in our case, that will be at time equals zero. And then y at the value, oh, and I guess those additional ones are for this higher order. Um, okay, I think now I understand the syntax. So the initial condition for us would be, uh, so time equals zero. And uh, the charge at that initial time should be to not, but if I do this, it'll complain because I haven't defined the Q0 yet. So let me declare Q0 as a variable that I'm going to use to indicate my initial charge. So this is our initial conditions. So let me do the dissolve again. And uh, I'm going to say my initial conditions are equal to the variable I defined as ICS. This looks a little bit confusing for those who are not familiar with the Python syntax. Uh, what this means is, so ICS stands for the uh, parameter keyword. This is one of the inputs to the function dissolve. So that's what this ICS stands for, parameter keyword. 
And with this equal sign, I'm saying, okay, set that parameter to be this value. And this value is the variable, uh, the list that's named ICS. Um, I, I think once you get used to it, it's a super natural way to write it, which is why I did it. And yeah, there it is. There's our answer. Q0 times, uh, so you know, this says, oh, yeah, that is equal to Q0. And um, I think I spent a lot of time just uh, talking about how you uh, type things in, then actually, you know, I didn't spend any time coming up with this answer. There's our answer. We are done. <laughs> um, let me, um, so in the version of the lecture where I did, did this manually, it took me um, like uh, uh, 40 minutes a total to do everything. Let me leverage what I have on screen here to try to do this um, more quickly. Because, so, okay, so far I haven't saved any time, but I can make a better argument for computer algebra system saving your time if I do the second version. So I'm going to just modify my circuit a little bit. Let's do the uh, charging cycle analysis. So for the charging cycle, I'm gonna have to change up a few things. And I have to say, okay, my initial charge no longer Q0, um, uh, it's gonna be initial charge will be zero. And uh, I need some uh, circuit element that's going to charge up things. So let me just uh, do that here, put up uh, a battery here. And the battery gets uh, inserted into this space at time equals zero. And the value of the battery would be V0. Okay, I wonder how much of the previous equation I can keep. So let me just erase the answers that uh, that was for the discharging cycle that wouldn't apply anymore. And uh, I think I should erase this as well. Uh, what I'm going back to is the Kirchhoff's rules. Junction rules still, you know, gives only trivi most trivial of the expressions. Um, and I guess um, as I go across uh, this uh, capacitor, I can still say that my charge Q, um, this symbol Q here, would represent amount of charge on the capacitor. And uh, let's say over time, we'll build it up so that it's a plus Q here and minus Q here. And then I think everything I wrote here so far is okay. And I have positive current flowing across the register, voltage drop, so far so good. Okay, and here I have to go across the uh, battery, all right? So let me just add that additional contribution to the voltage. So plus V0, and now I'm back to where I started, it's equal to zero. Okay, all of that seems fine. Uh, Let's think through um, if uh, this assigned convention that I have here is right. So I'm thinking at time equals zero. My charge starts out at zero. So charge here is gonna build up, increase. Um, so, and I want the current to be positive. Huh, then is this right? If my charge is increasing, then, um, then minus. But that's a little bit weird because I didn't change any other part of the circuit. Why should this relationship now suddenly go from minus to plus? And, um, and I'm being a little bit disingenuous because I spotted this like a couple of minutes ago. Um, you do have to be careful with the science here. So I was saying at time equals zero, my charge is increasing. But if you look at carefully how these uh, charges are labeled here, the way the charges are going to build up here at time equals zero, it's not actually minus Q plus Q, because as the current flows this way, you are going to accumulate positive charges here. Um, so, uh, so, you know, the way to fix it, you can actually do it a couple different ways. And I think the way I've done it in the other lecture is I recognize, okay, uh, plus Q here, minus Q there, flip this sign and flip this sign. And you can definitely do it that way. That's perfectly valid. You can do that. Let me show that the other way will also give you the correct answer. You just have to be careful in how you uh, process it. So in the other way, um, there's nothing for me to change here. 
uh, I can retain this minus sign. And what I'll have to be careful is to recognize that at time equals zero, as positive charges build up and negative charges build up here, what I'll actually have is um, the Q as a function of time will be negative at uh, small values of time greater than zero. The, the way you describe the charge that builds up here, you de describe it as a negative charge because the way it actually builds up is opposite of how I um, assume the directions when I wrote down this equation. So I need that modification to the equation. Um, and okay, so with that, let me just plug in all the things and I end up with, um, so Q over C and plug it in plus R dQ dt plus V naught is equal to zero. So that's my differential equation. The voltage of the battery should be known somehow. And then I have one unknown Q function um, in terms of all the other known things. So I should be able to solve it. So now let's solve it in computer algebra system. Um, let's see. Oh, I need to declare my variable. Um, we not. I don't think I've used it yet. Okay, uh, let me define my equation two. That's gonna be Q over C plus R times derivative Q reduced respect to time T plus V naught is equal to zero. That's my differential equation two. Uh, compare and make sure it looks okay. Um, okay, let's solve for um, Differential equation two in terms of Q. Uh, let's just start with just no initial conditions. Um, none. Um, my independent variable st is still P. And there it is. There's your answer. And uh, you will, you might note that uh, that looks a bit complicated. Um, so let's uh, plug in the, um, and you know it has to do with the, this integration constant. Let's plug in the known initial conditions. So the known initial condition would be okay. I'm going to have um, uh, at time equals zero. I'm going to have amount of charge equal to zero. And I think I can take a guess at what my current will be, but I don't think I need to plug that in because this is a first order. Let's give that a try. So there it is. And oh, uh, I think this can be simplified a little bit. So let me do a full simplify. I think that'll um, factor out some things. Uh, never mind, it doesn't. Okay. What it should factor out are these C times V naught. C times V naught. They should be factored out. So let me write down the uh, factored version of that. So the factored version of that says the amount of charge on the capacitor as a function of time is equal to, don't forget that minus sign, minus, and then factor out C V naught, C V naught times, okay, so here, uh, let me do one more algebra step, which is, I see this here, e to the minus t uh, over rc. I can distribute it into these two. Then with this term, you see that this cancels out that. So I'm going to say one. One minus, and you know, this times this will give me e to the minus t over rc. Parenthesis close and nothing else remaining there. Yeah, that's my answer. Charge on the capacitor as a function of time. And you can see here, okay, so at time equals zero, um, this uh, exponential will be one. So one minus one, you get zero. As time goes on, this portion of the expression is undergoing exponential decay. So one minus something that goes exponential decay, it'll end up looking like an upside down exponential decay. And that's exactly what charging thing looks like. Oh, except in this particular case, because this minus sign, it'll be upside down and then pull it around again, because it's on the negative side. Uh, but yeah, other than the minus sign, which we were expecting, um, this should be the exact answer that you see me get, um, except, you know, 
uh, six minutes later than what I have now. So, so that's the demonstration of the uh, analysis of the RC circuit, um, RC time dependent circuit with the computer algebra system. Oh, I think I said I would do the LR circuit as well. So let me do that. I think I can do that pretty quickly. So um, computer algebra system for a um, um, LR circuit. Let me do the version where I'm charging it up. So I have this uh, series of circuit of a battery of voltage Vna hooked up to an inductor of inductance L, finally hooked up to a register of resistance R. Okay, and uh, a valid question to ask for a circuit like this would be, what is the current through the circuit as a function of time? It has to be as a function of time because of the property of inductor, which says the voltage difference delta V across inductor is the inductance times di dt. And this derivative here prevents, of, prevents current change from taking suddenly. Because if a current suddenly changes, then your full amount of voltage required to do that is infinite. So the current through the inductor can only increase at a particular rate that's uh, limited by the amount of voltage available. So, okay, that, well, seems good. Um, so let me write down, uh, so I'm not gonna bother uh, pretending that I'm going to write down Kirchhoff's uh, junction rule because junction rule doesn't uh, give you anything. So I'm gonna just write it down for the loop rule. Uh, so let me start off from this point here. As I go across the battery, I gain the voltage of plus V naught. And as I go across the inductor, hmm, it's going to be either plus or minus the amount of voltage change across inductor, L, D, I, D, T. So uh, I'll figure out the sign in a little bit. So as I go through the register, um, I'm going with the direction of labeled current. So it's going to be decrease in voltage uh, in the amount of I times R. And I'm back to where I started. That's equal to zero. Okay, this plus or minus thing. Um, so this is what you have to think through. First, so what I'm guided by is what do I want the sign of the overall quantity to be? And I think um, at time equals zero, I want this overall quantity, including sign and the derivative. I want that to be negative because my V naught is positive. I need, and I need to have something that will add to V naught to get me zero. So I need this entire thing to be negative. So let's look at di dt at time equals zero. As your current is increasing, so at current at time equals zero is zero. And I think it makes sense that once you hook up the battery, current should flow in this direction. It's not going to flow the other way. And as it does, it's increasing from zero to a positive value. So my di dt is positive. Um, L is positive by definition, which means, okay, so here I need to pick a minus sign so that um, this overall quantity is negative. Um, and, and I think it, it also makes, oh, yeah, and as I was doing this analysis, I was kind of thinking, oh, well, what if, if, if I ignore register? Because you can imagine this circuit where resistance is negligibly small. So, so okay, that's my equation. And I think I'm done because uh, I don't have any, um, I don't have Q as a dynamical variable. So I just have I and I think that's it. I is my unknown. I'm all good. So um, yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, it, it's not solved for anything, but uh, I have computer algebra system. They can just analyze the whole thing. So let me do that. I'm gonna take this here. Uh, I think I have declared all the variables. Oh, except for L. So let me declare L. Um, and I have a feeling, wait, do I need I naught? You know, I, I don't need I naught because my current at the time equals zero is zero. So let me write down my differential equation three of the today <laughs> um, is V naught minus L times Oh, well, wait, I need to write that because when I do derivative i as a function of time, yeah, I'm going to get this. So I need to redefine i to be um, 
a function named i of time t. So that when I take the derivative, it will correctly take the derivative. So, okay, my equation three is going to be v naught minus L times derivative of i with respect to t minus parent i times r is equal to zero. Okay, that's my differential equation. Let's uh, solve it. Differential equation solve, equation three, um, my um, dependent variable i, <laughs> um, and let's say initial condition is none for now, default, uh, and independent variable is t. Oh, that was quick. There's my answer. Uh, so that's uh, the, yeah, and this, this kind of looks like a charging uh, a circuit. You have some constant uh, plus this thing. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to do the same thing. Put this, uh, uh, distribute this in so that this gets canceled out by that. And I have this exponentially decaying thing here. Um, yeah, I'm a little concerned that, um, hmm. Do I have two positive terms? Let me plug in my initial condition. So my initial condition for i is that, well, at time equals zero, my current i is zero. That's my initial condition. And when I say that's equal to, ah, okay, it got resolved. So with that initial condition, the other term becomes minus of vina. Good. So, so there's my answer. Let me write it down. Um, and you can see an advantage of a computer algebra system. You know, the first time I did it, it took a lot of time, practically the same amount of time it took me to do it by hand. But each time I do it, um, I get more used to it and I get faster. Because it, it basically, the one thing that took a lot of time is for me to learn the syntax. And once I know the syntax, then it's a lot quicker. So my current as a function of time is equal to, uh, I'm going to do some uh, on the fly factoring and distributing. I'm going to factor out V naught because I want to. And I'm going to retain this divided by R in the factored form. So I'll have V naught divided by R, multiplying to the entire parenthetical thing. And I'm going to distribute this exponential term. So as I distribute it, it cancels out this term to give me one minus I factored out for naught, so I have just e to the uh, minus, and let me do this. Uh, it says minus r times t over l. Uh, I'm going to write this l and r in the nested fraction form, so that it says minus t divided by l over r. You can kind of go through the nested fraction algebra to see, oh, that's the same as that. So, so yeah, this is the answer. Current is a function of time, and that looks like a charging uh, form, as in at time equals zero, this is one, so one minus one, zero, no current. But as time goes on, the circuit charges up, the, um, and you know this uh, decreases from one to some ever decreasing value, so you get uh, the terminal current of V naught over R. That's exactly what you see and what you get from this equation. Let me use the remaining five minutes to do this um, LC circuit properly. Because this is one where you've seen me do this circuit, um, uh, but you know by guessing um, what I think is the correct answer. I did it by guess and check. And I mean, you know, the checking portion makes it mathematically rigorous. But uh, maybe the solution I got isn't a unique solution. Uh, maybe you don't believe me when I say, oh, there should be two <laughs> linearly independent solutions. So this is where computer algebra system is really useful. So uh, let me get to this point here in the video so that I can kind of save on the writing of the equations. So I'll get, the, um, get to this so far. So, okay, yeah. I think uh, a little bit farther. I, I could deal with a, a system of equations, but here it's already in the form that I want to use. So let me do that. So that is the differential equation that I want to solve for. Let's, uh, so, you know, in the lecture where I did this by hand, 
I didn't have any way to actually solve for it, so I made a guess that I conveniently knew was correct. So here, now I'm going to actually do it properly. Let's see, I think I have almost all the variables defined. Uh, yeah, so I can just say, let me just make sure the derivative of q with respect to t. Okay, yeah. I think, is this the how you do second order? No. Wait, how do I do second order derivative? Um, okay, yeah, that is, um, yeah, okay, that seems good. Okay, so, um, yeah, so my equation four, that's my LC circuit equation, is um, Q as a function of time divided by C plus uh, inductance times deriv second derivative of Q with respect to time is equal to zero. That's my equation four. Let's try solving it. Uh, dissolve um, the equation four. Um, my independent variable is Q again, or I'm sorry, dependent variable is Q. Uh, let's say initial conditions, none uh, for now. And that'll give us the general solution. Um, and the, my independent variable is time t. Okay. Ah, uh, wait, what did I? Oh, it's time t. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, uh, it, um, um, computer algebra systems tend to assume things are super general. So it's asking this question basically. Is, uh, is capacitance times inductance positive or negative? Of course it's positive, okay. But <laughs> since the CS doesn't know that, let's uh, tell it that it is positive. Assume that C times L is positive. Okay. Now let's redo it. Uh, and there it is. There's my answer. And um, I forget if I've done um, second order differential equations for this class already. Now, there's a way to do this kind of the long way. So this is your general solution. And you can obtain your particular solution by plugging in your boundary conditions. Um, and you plug in your boundary conditions for, I think for this circuit, I had it so that at time equals zero, it was fully charged up and current was zero. And um, you, you can basically do that. You have a Q as a function of time. You can take the derivative to get an expression for current and you know plug in the expressions and solve for this K2 and K1. All that's good. You can do that. Uh, now I can, now I learned how to use it. I can use this parameter to let computer algebra system do all that for me. I can just plug in my initial condition. So, um, so as I do this solution of the differential equation, so my initial condition will be at time equals zero, and it's the condition for the charge Q. And at time equals zero, amount of charge is Q naught. And I think I already declared the symbol, so that's good. And now if you stop it here, you will have specified an incomplete set of um, the uh, initial conditions. I don't know what it'll do if I simply do the, yeah, yeah. It, um, it, it's complaining because, um, so when you look at this, uh, you have, um, you have two uh, coefficients that come up. And that comes from the fact that you are dealing with a second order differential equation. So there are two linearly independent solutions. And so when I stop here, just specifying what the value of the function was at time equals zero, uh, I haven't done enough. I have to also specify what was the value of the first two derivative at time equals zero. So I need to say, okay, at time equals zero, um, my current was zero. So the derivative of Q, it was zero. So the, the, the system actually needs that information to be able to give me an answer. And there it is, that's my answer. Um, Q naught, that's the amplitude of oscillation times I get this oscillatory function, uh, cosine of T and um, this uh, one over square root of LC is, um, that's my omega, natural frequency of oscillation. So it was a, um, 
you know, in the lecture, it took me quite a few more minutes from this point on, uh, another 35 minutes <laughs> to get to that answer. There it is in the computer algebra system. And in fact, I'm a little bit over time, but uh, I can do this as well. So when you look at the chapter 14 lecture, I actually go on to talk about RLC circuit. And you know, this was so mathematically challenging that I really had to introduce this new mathematical device for me to be able to solve it. And, and all of that is true. I don't mean to mock myself for doing that. But let me show you just how, um, how easily this is done in, with the computer algebra system. So I'm just gonna advance the lecture to the point where I have written down my system of equations. It took me 30 minutes to explain, um, go through this with the Kirchhoff's loop rule and write down this uh, system of equation. It's uh, remarkably close to what I had before. Uh, so, you know, with the LC circuit, really the difference between LC circuit and RLC circuit is presence of the register. So, you know, when you look at equation four, it had this, um, it had this, it was just missing this one. So for equation five, let me just uh, write it down as, um, I'm just gonna copy these. and then just to add, and order doesn't matter in adding. So add um, r, oh, I hope it works out okay. r times the derivative of q as a function of time, just the single derivative that's equal to zero. So that's it, equation five. Okay, I think it all looks good. Yeah, so that's my equation. Uh, let's just uh, solve it using this solve. Um, let me just go skip straight to the version with these initial conditions and I will explain why. So equation five, this solve. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah, it's asking, okay, is it positive, negative, or zero? Well, um, I think uh, if you read the textbook section that relates to this, this has to do with whether the damping is uh, underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped. And I think I remember the underdamped cases where my resistance is relatively small. So in the, I, I want the answer for the underdamped case. That's the one that kind of looks um, meaningful to me. Uh, so I think I want this quantity to be negative because that's the scenario you would have when r is equal to zero. So let me do this. Assume that this whole expression here is negative. This, uh, that's the scenario I would have when um, when r is zero. And I just want to say, um, analyze it for us situations where I have r that's not zero, but you know close to zero. So assume that, and let's just <laughs> redo that. But I already assumed that c times c times r squared minus 4l is, oh, okay. Uh, I might have to simplify it for it a little bit. So I'll do it this way. Uh, I'm going to say this thing is uh, less than the thing on the right. That's uh, identical to saying that this uh, thing is negative, but it's specified in a way that's a little bit easier for the computer algebra system to digest. Ah, uh, all right, awesome C is positive. <laughs> um, there it is. Um, wow, it looks uh, super complicated. Um, can I simplify it in any way? <laughs> Let me see. Uh, uh, Full simplify. No, not really. So this would be the justification for still having the uh, the um, the complex exponentials. The thing that uh, making it look complicated is this combination of cosine and sine. And uh, yeah, all right. I, I think uh, to make a sense of this, I mean, okay. So I have obtained the solution much more quickly than. Um, than I could do otherwise. And, you know, if you want to kind of uh, get a sense of what the solution looks like, you can plot it. Um, so uh, let me just put this into solution. Um, oops, uh, piece of, uh, well, 
with uh, uh, let me just type it in. <laughs> so equation five q. Okay. So okay. Uh, let me put this into solution. And what I can do is um, substitute values like, okay, my L is equal to one. Um, I'm doing this in arbitrary units. And let's say Q naught is equal to one, um, uh, C is equal to one. Let me put in a small value for R. R is equal to, uh, uh, Q is equal to, wait, no. R is equal to 0 0.01. Um, I think that might be enough, let me see. Um, yeah, so this is a function now I can plot. So I can take this, plot it as a function of time, and get something. <laughs> and um, this is a kind of a, a way you can use. Uh, that looks weird. Uh, let me have the time go from zero to some relatively large value. Plot it from time. Uh, from 0 to 100. Ah, there it is. Okay, I, 100 is not large enough. I can, I need to say, let me make the R smaller uh, or R bigger uh, so that it'll damp out more quickly. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> so it looks like a harmonic, um, it, it's, it looks like a oscillation that's been damped over time. And uh, so, you know, this is one of the techniques for working the computer algebra system. And sometimes, you know, complicated expressions that you get, uh, it is easier to grab, um, develop a sense of it if you uh, <laughs> plot it <laughs> with some numbers. So, okay, let me stop it here. I think that's uh, enough of a demonstration of using SageMath in context like um, dealing with uh, time varying circuits and uh, next week we'll be covering AC circuits and if there's time I will also demonstrate um, how you might be able to use computer algebra system for that.